Hey, what's going on, everyone? It's time for another episode of Whistle Kick Martial Arts Radio. And here we are, it's episode 115. This episode is all about the role money plays and doesn't play in martial arts competition. I'm Whistle Kick's founder, but I'm better known as your host, Jeremy Lesniak. Whistle Kick, if you don't know, makes the best sparring gear, apparel, and accessories for practitioners and fans of traditional martial arts. I'd like to welcome the new listeners and thank everyone that's come back again. All of our past podcast episodes, show notes, and a lot more are at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. From that site, you can sign up for our newsletter, and I really think you should, because we offer exclusive content to subscribers, great discounts, and it's the only place to find out about who's coming up next on the show. You've probably heard me mention our line of no sweat shirts before. They're super lightweight, incredibly comfortable. They go great under your uniform, and we have them in black, white, and gray just for that purpose. But they're also great anytime you just want a comfortable, lightweight tee. You can find them in red and blue, green, and some other colors as well. Find them over at whistlekick.com. On to the show. We've talked on this show before about competition and its role in the martial arts. We ask our guests about their competitive experience, and we've even done episodes on martial arts tournaments. One of the things I've seen lately on social media revolves around criticism of the way money is handed out at competitions. Some are calling for equal payouts for men's and women's divisions. Others are calling for parity between the adult and senior divisions. Now, money is important. Of course it's important, right? While I would agree with the adage that money doesn't buy happiness, it's pretty hard to be happy when you don't have any. Now, let's explore the ties between money and competitive martial arts and how we might actually see money bring martial arts to the next level. Martial arts, for the majority of us, is a passion. You likely know instructors, maybe you are one, that teach for little to no money. Even many of those that do often put some of their own money towards rent or other expenses for operating their school. This isn't a judgment one way or the other at all. It's simply an observation. People tend to have very strong feelings about money, And that's not just limited to martial arts. People also tend to have strong feelings about martial arts. It's no surprise then that the idea of martial arts as a profession would get some folks amped up. Historically, martial arts hasn't been a major commercial enterprise. Whether we're talking about ancient temples or fishing villages, monks or family instructors, there wasn't a lot of money available. So it makes sense that money and martial arts weren't strongly tied. The importance back then, as for so many now, is simply to teach, to pass on the knowledge, not to earn a living from it, certainly not to get rich from doing it. We all know the cliche of the martial arts student trading their time for lessons. It was at the heart of the Karate Kid. But all of that excludes competition. There's a big difference in the way the world is today versus then, a difference in the way martial arts is approached as a traditional lifestyle versus a competitive endeavor. That's not saying one is bad or one is better. But if your goal is to succeed in competition, your training will be different and likely more time-consuming than if your goal is to learn and enjoy martial arts classes. Even today, many martial artists have pushed back against the commercial elements of the world as they try to take hold billing services, consulting, and other professional elements that are common in every other industry are discouraged and even scorned by so many martial artists and even martial arts instructors, including martial arts instructors who are losing money at their school. Why? Since that's a bit outside what we're talking about today, I'll leave it to you to draw your own conclusions, but I will wrap that into our conversation by saying, hey, We've got to understand our attitudes towards money before we can understand why some of these conversations are taking place. Hopefully that all made sense. When we see money pop up in a martial arts event, and let's be clear, we're talking about a traditional martial arts event, a tournament, not boxing, wrestling, kickboxing, or MMA, we see relatively small cash prizes. Even the largest events pay out tens of thousands of dollars, and that's not just for one prize, that's for the overall purse. I think the largest I've seen has been somewhere around $100,000 for a single event. Now, I may be wrong. We might be at some now that are up into the 200000 But while that seems like a lot of money, 
consider that realistically, the most any one person is going to take home from those events is twenty, maybe thirty to thousand dollars, and that's for the largest event and winning every division that they can. That money can certainly go a long way towards encouraging others to compete for hopes of winning. The best competitors will likely stick around longer because they're likely to win some money. For these top-tier competitors, they're usually not covering their expenses, or at least not all of them, because they're sponsored. Other than an admittedly large time investment, there's not a lot of risk for them. And that keeps people attending events and helps promoters bring in more money. On the other side, money has been shown to corrupt things. The quest for money has been criticized as long as money has existed. Some promoters refuse to give away cash at their events because they say it attracts a negative element. People compete in martial arts events for different reasons. Some do it for fun, some to learn, some because they're trying to prove something to themselves. There are a variety of good reasons to compete. Again, we've talked about many of them on this show. Money is a whole different reason and one we haven't tackled before today. If you've been to a tournament, you've likely seen some sore losers. Some people that felt they were wronged and thus cheated out of a score or a trophy. It's only natural that such reactions increase when competitors feel that money was taken from them. The larger the figure, the more likely it is to happen. Money is important to people people kill for money. The larger the payouts, the more challenging it becomes to manage all of the expectations of those competing for it. And that's exactly why we need more and larger cash payouts at events. I'm not calling for promoters to hand over all of their profits. I'm also not saying all events should pay the winners. I'm saying that if we look at ways to increase payouts to winners, we will simultaneously be laying groundwork to grow martial arts overall. On episode 113, we talked about Olympic karate being included as a demonstration sport for Tokyo, Japan in 2020. Exposure is clearly a benefit to martial arts. Is there anyone that doesn't believe that the martial arts movies of the 60s and 70s helped grow martial arts in the US and the world? When we think about sports developed in recent times, the two that come to my mind are mixed martial arts, MMA, and CrossFit it's pretty clear that the television exposure both have garnered has helped grow the sports side of both mixed martial arts and CrossFit. Top-level MMA fighters earn millions of dollars per match, and even entry-level professionals in the UFC make $5,000 and up per match. CrossFit, while a younger sport, has seen a rapid rise in the payout to athletes, with the top male and female winners taking home over $250,000 for winning the yearly individual titles. And with those figures come true professional status. When someone's job is training and competing, it gives them the freedom to do what is best for that role. Many of us know the challenge of working multiple jobs. I've certainly done that in the past. And I know it makes it hard to give any one task, one job, your best effort. As the money grew in the UFC and CrossFit, we saw people dedicate their lives to the quest for winning titles. The very best step forward because now there was a chance to not only be the best, but get better through the process of training and earn a living, in some cases a great living, doing all of it. Is there anyone that thinks all of our best martial artists can be found in the current crop of national level competitors? That isn't to take anything away from the competitors that are out there today. They are tremendous martial artists and incredible athletes. I admire them. Heck, Whistlekick sponsors some of them. There's a lot of value in competition, and that's why we're talking about it. If it becomes a reasonable occurrence for top-level martial arts competitors to earn a decent living from competition, we'll see tremendous benefits throughout the martial arts. I'm a business owner. Most of you know that. As a business owner, I'm also a big fan of of free market economies. No, this isn't going to turn into a lesson on economics, but it's an important piece to bring in here. I see the competitive martial arts landscape as a free market. An injection of money to that market will spread throughout everything we do in the martial arts. More and larger payouts will attract more and better competitors. More competitors means more profit in events, and promoters will get creative to attract the biggest and best competitors. This creativity will lead to new formats for competition, 
some of which will inevitably be designed for television and streaming on the web. It's true, martial arts does make it onto TV once in a while, but not nearly the way other sports are watched. Why? Because the format that we typically use doesn't jive with TV. As competitors get more TV time, there will be a push for sponsorships inside and outside of martial arts products. We'll see personalities develop, and from that, people will have favorite competitors. While many of us do now, I look forward to a day when people that don't train in martial arts know some of the larger competitive names. With TV exposure and sponsorships, we'll see more people consider martial arts as an activity and a career. We'll start to see more local and regional teams pop up. I know that Olympic Taekwondo is working on securing NCAA status for college players. From there, perhaps high school teams will follow. The same might happen with karate after the Olympics. People want to imitate those that they look up to. We know that. And the more we have great martial artists on television and in popular culture and the media, the more aspiring martial artists will have. The big hole to this, the part that makes it all work, is increasing the money. How do we do that? It's a basic question of economics. The way most events are structured now, the schools and promoters bring competitors who pay a fee, some of them bring spectators with them, and that promoter makes a profit. At the next event, the pattern repeats and all of the promoters make a profit, hopefully, and all of the martial arts competing are paying for it. Unfortunately, there aren't that many of us, and the majority of us don't even compete often or at all. So the brunt of this is being shouldered by a relatively small group of people who love to compete in the martial arts. We need outside money. We need non-martial arts money. And in order for that to work, tournaments need to cater not to the competitor, but the spectator. The more enjoyable an event is for the people watching, the more the money comes. Show me any successful professional level sport where the players, the competitors are the first priority. I'm not saying we should stop caring about them. I'm saying that we need to build events that attract more people watching them. Not all of them, because I love what we're doing now. But some of them. We need some variety. With those spectators comes more vendors, more money, bigger cash prizes, sponsorships, and even more profit. It's a snowball effect that no one seems to have cracked the code for. Yet. I do believe someone will solve the problem. And it can't happen soon enough for me. I believe there's benefit in competition, and the more money that circulates at competitions, the more it helps both the sports side and traditional side grow. The sports side grows as the money shows up, the traditional side grows as the exposure of the sport grows. Where would recreational basketball be without the NBA? Few children, with a steadily decreasing number as they age, think they'll ever make it as a professional athlete. But watching their favorite players makes them want to be like them. They buy their shoes and emulate their movements on the court. One of the greatest things we can do for martial arts growth is fostering the same sort of role models. And until we bring in money from outside our relatively small martial arts competition economy, there won't be enough money to build up the major personalities we need for the marketing of our events. Martial arts is exciting to watch. And with some adjustments to rules and presentation, I truly believe we could have something even larger than the UFC. What are your thoughts? I know this can be a hot button issue for some, but we want to know what you think. Whatever your comments, let us know. You can comment on the show notes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com or social media, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Instagram, YouTube. The username is whistlekick. If you want to be a guest on the show, or maybe you have an idea for a show topic like today, go ahead and fill out the form on the website. And don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter so you can stay up on everything we do. You can learn more about our products at whistlekick.com, like our great shirts, and you can check out our awesome line of sparring gear there or on Amazon. And that does it for today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.